Um, hello, can everyone hear me? Hi, my name is uh, Hatim. Um, I go by my middle name. Um, Shazada Hatim is my name. So I'm going to be talking about challenges in, uh, challenges in adopting microservices for an internal service ecosystem in a large uh, corporation. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, the title, but I will try to hopefully explain it. So I'm um, from Pakistan, but these days I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, anyone from Sweden here? No? And previously I worked for, uh, in a microservice ecosystem at a company called Asa Abloy. Um, if you remember uh, from a while ago, um, there was a Apple, um, when Apple launched their Apple Watch, they uh, said that you could use the Apple Watch to open hotel door locks, so that was us, just to sort of um, brag a little. And currently I'm working at Isatel as a software developer helping uh, to tame a monolith, and I love to uh, share what I learned. So most of you guys are from Germany, right? So you must know this illustration done by a German 100 years ago. So which, which, do you, uh, which line do you think is, uh, um, is the bigger one? Are they equal? What do you guys think? They're equal? No, they're not. Sorry. That was the animation. So I actually made them slightly smaller, just on purpose, to trick you guys. And I promise to not resort to any more juvenile tactics for the rest of this talk, but I will press upon this point later that you really need to um, evaluate things on your own. Don't uh, make decisions based on past learnings or like if somebody else told you so. Um, so this is the agenda. Um, I'm gonna be taking you a little bit of background and then uh, background about uh, what uh, uh, the microservice ecosystem that um, I was helping build. And only we, I will only talk about three of the challenges, um, three of the most um, important challenges that, in my opinion, uh, we experienced. So, background. So, Asa Abloy, uh, where I worked, uh, is a large multinational uh, electronic locks company. They make uh, physical locks as well, uh, like other, other things like doors, but that's, that's the kind of business that I'm talking about. It has a history of successful monolithic applications that, you know, the applications that are actually used, people pay for. Um, and the company wanted to consolidate uh, different software projects because um, they had a very good history of consolidating hardware projects. And when you're consolidating hardware projects, what you do is you um, gather different requirements and you go to the market and see like, okay, these processors and these components are the best fit and then you can create uh, building blocks which you can give to your different uh, divisions uh, so, uh, so they can use them in a modular fashion and this also gives you better pricing. So they had a very good history of doing that for quite some time and it was called modular building set. So they wanted to apply a similar strategy to software. So it's very interesting that this, uh, this whole initiative was uh, like a top-down approach. It, it came from the top management, okay. Uh, we did this uh, modular building set in ha hardware. Let's try to do something similar in software. And these were the goals that they gave us. Um, to promote reuse of software, and to have a common way of working amongst various teams, to deliver software at a much faster pace in, in, in the hardware-driven business, which is not always a um, uh, uh, very easy thing to do. And the most important one was developing such systems on many sites with small cross-functional teams. And I, I believe that was, the, uh, that was the underlying reason of all this uh, initiative. So internal service or service ecosystems is uh, not something new. Um, people have been studying it for some time. These are two definitions uh, that I found in the academia world. And the second one is uh, done by, it's a research done by people from University of Nuremberg and in Simmons. And it says like, uh, like internal ecosystems involve a set of internal organizational units that are self 
contain profit centers with own business objectives. So that's what the problem we were trying to solve. We had different um, business units that are, they were own profit centers. And they wanted to reuse software amongst each other. And we wanted to create them in a, not just libraries, we wanted to create services. So this is how it would, uh, would look. And you might notice that there are like T1, TA, and T alpha. That's just to signify teams. And these are equal teams, so I didn't say team one or two, otherwise it would be so um, politically incorrect. Um, so one of the teams uh, does uh, service one, which could be something that is used by everyone. It could be something like authentication service. And each of these uh, vertical lines is essentially a product and horizontal lines are services. So service one is done by team one, for example. Service two and three is done by team A. Service um, four is done by team alpha, and it only concerns two products. And uh, service five might not even have a clear ownership. It might be something like a GitHub project, for example, uh, that people are contributing to. So there is no clear ownership. So that's the kind of ecosystem um, that uh, I was uh, involved in. Example services could be uh, firmware update service. Use. So you don't want um, each product to implement their own way of updating firmware or like sending out firmware updates because it's very similar in um, different, even if they're different products. Common login, um, packaging different credentials. Uh, when you have, um, if you have some sort of uh, access rights that you need to send to different locks, how do you um, program them? Uh, the locks might have different formats, and we want to uh, abstract it uh, for each um, uh, one, one service that can send uh, to different locks. So these are some of the services that I have. So enough of the background. Um, what I wanted to do is like want to, I wanted to learn how, um, how we did or um, like what we can learn from uh, our experience. So I went around on the internet and like see what people were, uh, like what kind of people, uh, questions people were asking. So there is an InfoQ survey that you might be familiar with. Um, the title is, I copied it exactly, what scares you the most about adopting microservice architecture? Um, how many of you have seen this uh, um, survey before? So I've, uh, I have a link for this, um, like which would be, uh, I will post uh, with, with the slides. So I would encourage you to take this uh, survey and uh, see where you fall. Um, so one of the most uh, like scariest thing that people um, have reported in this survey uh, is um, op operational overhead. And that has to do like, you know, because microservices, uh, when you start doing microservices, you have to do a lot of um, uh, operation stuff. So, um, and we found the same, uh, we found it to be very true because uh, we didn't even have uh, like a DevOps culture. We had, what we had is a, a common operations team. And the reason we had a common operations team was because each of these um, services, even though they were developed by uh, these uh, teams that are uh, like, like a single team, but these services are used by multiple divisions and they don't necessarily, uh, want, they want to have like some sort of common centralized control and they don't, they don't want uh, each team to be responsible for those services. Or you can say like more like uh, for compliance reason, somebody to blame, like if something goes wrong. Uh, and it, it had to be 24-7. Um, so we had to hire safety-focused personnel with developer background. Uh, we had to focus on tr um, culture training. So, and dedicated members of operations team collaborated with the service team members on a daily or weekly basis. I think uh, if, if you have a dedicated on-site person, that's even better, but we had to do it over uh, video link. 
uh, service dev devs at least had a requirement of some sort of operational knowledge uh, that everybody needed to know. So the least amount of things that you need to know, um, how, to be, uh, how, to, how you can check logs, how you can uh, redeploy uh, a service if something goes wrong. But we did not, uh, uh, usually it was always the 24-7 operation, operations team that was doing all of this. Uh, this setup worked better than having a gatekeeper operations team. Uh, but it is probably better to fix the organization to have a DevOps culture. It's not a good idea to have a, de uh, have a DevOps team. Uh, over here I talk about the uh, safety focus personnel. This next slide I probably stole from somebody, or, but I'm not, I can't attribute it, I'm sorry. So this is a, like, a, uh, these are two different kind of personalities that you have. Like, you have safety focused uh, people, <coughs> and aspirational uh, people who have aspiration goals and some people who have safety focus goals. So if you are uh, an EMT or working in the hospital, it's a good idea for you to be um, a safety focused person. You don't want to be aspirational. Oh, let me try this new technique on you. Maybe you might get better. You know, that's not a good idea in that kind of environment. So that's good for operational uh, side. And then you have like this you can say creative people, let's do it uh, kind of attitude. And they want to optimize, uh, they want to reduce friction. Uh, and these are like usually devs. So the good thing, the interesting thing I found about this, like uh, if you, uh, if the safety focused people have a setback, they redouble their efforts. And if you give them praise, then they are like, you know, they, um, they're a bit relaxed. It's the uh, opposite for um, aspirational people. They, if you praise them, uh, uh, they redouble their efforts. And if they have a setback, they basically disengage. So this might like, lead you to um, some sort of self-reflection, what kind of person you are yourself. Um, if you are praised, do you redouble your efforts? Then maybe you're in good company to be a developer. And if you, um, oh, sorry, um, uh, in, in both cases, but if you have a setback, uh, if you are discouraged, then you, uh, you probably want to go to operations, I guess. Uh, so the next challenge that we had was infrastructure. So we had a homegrown um, message bus uh, with 0MQ backed by Postgres. So the reason we wanted to do that was uh, we thought that it would be very simple and it would be uh, very easy to uh, get started with. We didn't want to do anything. Uh, it was 2014, so we, did, we didn't want anything more uh, complex at that time. But we found out that uh, doing all of this uh, was, uh, we resulted in things that were unstable and hard to maintain, and it was not our core business. Uh, and then, we wanted, we needed uh, some sort of service discovery and uh, we chose for a guilt inspired. How many of you guys uh, know uh, about guilt? There, I think there was, it was mentioned in the morning. Um, guilt inspired a uh, route 53 based service discovery where we basically, the way we discover services that the developers discovers the service and writes it to a, a static file and that's what it is. Uh, nothing more complex than that. In, in this case, not the file, actually. It's, uh, the, we were doing it to uh, EC2 uh, tags. We were using tags instead. And uh, using quick and dirty Ansible scripts. But very soon we realized that at, in Amazon you have a um, limit of 20 tags per instance. You, you cannot do more than that. So, I mean, um, very soon we discovered that it had limits. So it would have been better to have solved these things with uh, like properly earlier, early on, in my opinion, using, and uh, I believe uh, the teams um, concluded that we would be using Kafka and Council. Uh, Kafka for um, me uh, like messaging and Council for service discovery. But you could, of course, like use, um, um, like there's lots of new tools available um, in these spaces. And a tooling t a team would be a very good idea because um, these teams uh, like help you to uh, discover these tools. And you, you don't have to, um, if you have dedicated people working on tooling side, then you don't have to make these decisions yourself. And 
And this is like something that um, I firmly believe that um, not everybody needs to be worried too much about oh what um, how my message bus is going to be or how the log aggregation service is going to be. I think sometimes you probably want to focus more on your business side. I see at least one person from ThoughtWorks here. Um, so they have this um, nice um, uh, technology radar. And it has this thing called, uh, there are two things uh, that are interesting here. One is the high performance NV, and the, one, the other is microservice NV. So you should not do microservices, in my opinion, or uh, if you, know, you see other people, oh, like, you know, they're building so cool things and for high availability and like, big requirements. Maybe you don't have those requirements. Maybe first you should focus on your requirements and then find out, like, then decide the um, architecture. They also say a very good thing is that you should have your own technology radars. I think that's also a very good thing that um, uh, we started doing later on uh, was to build our own technology radar. So in, in this uh, like on radar, I would say Kafka and uh, console would be in, in the, by now it would be in trial phase for, uh, for that case. The last uh, challenge that I was, I'm going to talk about uh, briefly is uh, business. Uh, business, uh, what they really wanted was security and availability above all. Uh, scalability of teams and servers, even though they told us that you know, we wanted to scale it out, that was not really a concern. So once we dug deeper into the uh, requirements and when we, once we started building, this is what uh, kept coming back to us, that you know, it has to be secure because you can't have an online locking system which is not secure. And it has to be available because you don't want uh, to stand outside your door and be denied uh, because the system is down. So these were really the uh, actual requirements. And this couldn't be done easily in, um, in many different ways, including a monolith. Uh, requirements were usually not clear. And there were lots of missing pieces of information. And uh, there was like uh, this, people were talking, the uh, consultants were coming in, they were talking about bounded context. And quite a lot of the team members are like, what the hell is bounded context? So maybe people should be, like, you know, they should familiarize them, uh, themselves with like, this DDD stuff before we even jump into this uh, uh, and learn about your business and domain driven design before we go into um, uh, more complex things. So in summary, like uh, separate operation teams, as long as it was um, um, like a culture effort, it was good. And uh, duct taping is not a good idea. And uh, knowing your business, I think, is uh, uh, generally a good idea. And think for yourself and make your own radars, understand other people's context before you uh, quote them. Don't be uh, like these guys, like a sheep cyclone. Like uh, when I hear this, uh, see this in this, like, so I see like docker, 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 like everybody. <laughs> and, uh, be like, be more like this guy, like, you know, very, you know, like, why Docker? Or why microkernels? Like, you know, the, you just keep asking these kind of questions and you need to really um, uh, uh, think for yourself. Thank you for the microexchange team and uh, for my previous employer, Asa Abloy, and my current employer, Aizatil. Uh, Aizatil is hiring. Um, please uh, talk to me after this talk. Do we have time? Do we have time for questions? Yes, we have five minutes for questions. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Yes. Very much like your note about beware the duct taping. Do you have any advice on like objective measures or criteria? that would help you to understand when you should have avoided duct taping? I would say, like, first, uh, it's, it's, you could, if you're doing uh, this kind of stuff, maybe uh, you, you could have, like, some sort of a pioneer project where you basically test out things, but it shouldn't be, like, a production project. It, it could be your, like, hobby project, so you assess things, you don't, uh, um, so maybe, like, some sort of evaluation uh, you could do. Um, the other problem that I think uh, is there is that if you don't know your uh, 
business requirements in advance and you have to, uh, in, in the end you have to like hurry up, then you do these kind of things. Like, okay, I don't have time to do service discovery properly because my project manager wants X, Y, Z delivered by this. So I mean, better communication, better planning might help you. I don't, um, uh, don't have more objective criteria than that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.